Okay, I think we've got a good group here, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for attending the first Open Secrets Lobbying Masterclass session. In this series, we hope to educate you on what data is available and how to use lobbying disclosures uh, reports in your work. Uh, my name is Dan Aubel. I manage our federal lobbying and revolving door projects. And I'm joined today by Pete Quist, our Deputy Research Director, who is an expert in disclosure of money in state politics. Uh, also, thank you to Anna and Dylan from our media team who are helping manage things and run the Q&A. Uh, speaking of which, we will have time at the end for questions, so please drop any you think of uh, in the Q&A chat uh, as we present here. For anyone who may be unfamiliar with Open Secrets, we are the leading money in politics data organization. Uh, we're nonprofit and nonpartisan, and we collect disclosures uh, about money in politics ranging from campaign contributions to spending on ballot measures in the states uh, to, of course, lobbying and revolving door. Now, Two years ago, we were uh, two organizations, the Center for Responsive Politics, which focused on federal uh, politics, and the National Institute on Money in Politics, which focused on the state level. Uh, but we merged to form the new Open Secrets, and uh, now we are in the process of integrating data from both levels of government uh, so we can create new tools and uh, provide data for more comprehensive analyses uh, and the, the potential of which we hope to highlight in this uh, series of webinars. So today's session really serves as something of an introduction to what lobbying is, uh, what information about it gets reported and where uh, and how often as well as a demonstration of some of the open secrets tools you can use to augment your stories, uh, add context, uh, or even find new topics or uh, things to write about. The five sessions following today's will happen monthly, and they'll be more focused on particular topics. On July 12th, we will talk about healthcare and pharmaceutical lobbying. On August 10th, we will focus on uh, the defense industry and their influence. On September 13th, we'll look at energy and environmental interests. On October 18th is big tech. And on November 15th, we will look at social issues and some other aspects of lobbying that we may not have uh, covered yet. So things like immigration and uh, gun rights, gun control, uh, and we'll probably talk some more about foreign lobbying and revolving door at that last session as well. So with that, I will hand off to Pete to get us started. Hey everyone. Uh, so uh, as Dan mentioned, we're here to talk about lobbying today, and this will be a very um, uh, general introduction into the tools and, and data that we have available. Uh, I want to focus on defining uh, what that is that we're going to be looking at uh, and then Dan will get into uh, some of our federal lobbying uh, and I'll follow up with the state stuff. Um, so by lobbying here what we're referring to is the data that we collect at the federal level and across the states uh, related to uh, the money that's being spent to influence uh, legislators, uh, executives, and government agencies uh, at the uh, U.S. and state capitals. Uh, so uh, this definition of lobbying can vary a little bit uh, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Uh, you can, for example, lobby, uh, spend as a human being, spend a certain amount of time lobbying or a certain amount of money lobbying <clears throat> without uh, reaching a threshold to register as a lobbyist. Uh, that threshold may be defined differently in different places. Um, and similarly, as an organization trying to influence policy, how much effort you put in might dictate how much or whether you have to report uh, those efforts. But those are the kinds of efforts that we're looking at uh, here today. Uh, lobbying uh, reports at the federal level are filed with the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate. Uh, and at the state level, 
Uh, it is quite variable, um, but usually there is some sort of an ethics commission uh, or a campaign finance slash lobbying agency uh, that is a separate agency uh, or uh, some other office within the state uh, government that accepts uh, these lobbying reports. Uh, for our data, we collect that uh, information from Congress where it's filed there. And then at the state level where we're able to get uh, such uh, spending data, uh, we collect that from the states. Uh, every jurisdiction though gets to decide uh, how much disclosure there really is. Uh, so uh, while states uh, across the board do require uh, registration of lobbyists or clients, uh, and here I'm referring to as clients, the companies uh, or other organizations that are paying lobbying firms and lobbyists to, uh, to uh, lobby uh, the state government or the federal government, um, every state does require registration. Uh, some states do better than others at tying who is actually working for whom. Uh, the actual spending aspect of it is a little bit more of a challenge. Uh, almost all of the money spent on lobbying is actually how much those clients are paying the firms or the lobbyists to represent them. Uh, at the state level, um, where my expertise lies, uh, we typically see that among those states that report uh, different kinds of spending within their expenditure reports, uh, that compensation piece, how much those clients are paying those firms or lobbyists, accounts for around 80 or 90 and sometimes even more of a percent of the money uh, reported as lobbying efforts. About half of the states require uh, compensation to be reported and about half don't. Uh, so that is a very significant challenge for us uh, in terms of collecting data. And we'll get into a little bit more detail about disclosure practices at the state level a little bit later in this presentation. Uh, and with that, uh, I will kick it over to Dan to talk more about the federal. Thank you. Uh, so just to touch on the, I know, as Pete said, the federal lobbying data is reported on a, a quarterly schedule. Uh, so the next filings we'll see will be at the end of July, and they'll cover the second quarter of 2023. Uh, and the federal reports do focus very uh, uh, closely on actual contact with government officials. So things that are not included are like advertising or grassroots lobbying where a group will try to get their membership to contact uh, their member of Congress on an issue, that kind of thing uh, is not necessarily <clears throat> described in the federal filings. Uh, and I mentioned uh, that we also have a foreign lobby watch project that looks at the Foreign Agent Registration Act filings. Uh, we won't talk about that much today, but uh, I do want to point out that we have those filings which are made by uh, foreign governments and foreign political parties. Some uh, companies that are based overseas also file them and they cover a much broader uh, type of activity than just strict uh, what we're calling lobbying here today and what you would probably think of as lobbying. <clears throat> uh, but on the more domestic side, we have had laws governing lobbying for over 100 years, uh, but we didn't get real meaningful, reliable disclosure until about 25 years ago with the Lobbying Disclosure Act, and that's also when we start getting data. Um, so you can see here in our historical summary chart uh, that since 1998, the overall trend uh, in terms of spending was a long upward slope, peaking around 2009 or 2010 when three and a half billion dollars were spent. Uh, but the 2010s saw drops in that overall spending, as well as the number of registered lobbyists brought on by a variety of reasons, probably, including the economic fallout uh, from the 2008 financial crisis, uh, but also certainly more inside baseball topics uh, like Congress banning the earmark system by which a lot of horse trading and deal making was done, 
as well as President Obama instituting stricter rules on how official registered lobbyists could interact with his administration. But since 2017, we've seen things start to rise again. The new Trump administration is likely to have had a lot to do with that. Uh, <clears throat> the policies that had been non-starters before were maybe suddenly on the table. Things like, uh, you know, an ener energy producer maybe saw a little value in lobbying the Obama administration, uh, but they had new hope under uh, a new presidential administration and change in Congress. We saw a similar jump recently when Biden took office. Uh, and after a record first quarter this year, it looks like we may be in another sustained period of increases, uh, even when we account for inflation. So that's kind of the view from 10,000 feet. Uh, now we can look at some of the details. Uh, once you're here in the lobbying section of opensecrets.org, uh, you can explore and get into the data in a couple different ways. We provide ranked lists over here on the uh, left. So you can see uh, top spenders overall, the top spending industries, the bills that were targeted the most, uh, agencies that were uh, contacted the most, as well as uh, things like individual lobbyists who are giving the most in campaign contributions, uh, how much the top lobbying firms are bringing in. So these are good lists uh, where we have, uh, you know, both done the research of what industry a company is in, aggregated the, all the reports to make sure that the uh, numbers we're showing are not double counting anything, taken all that into account and given you these ranked lists so you can, uh, you know, if you're looking at pharmaceutical companies, you can look at our industry list and be able to say that they spend pretty much the most out of any industry. Uh, and you can describe industries that are nearby them on the list. <clears throat> the other uh, way you can get started is with this uh, search bar here. And that's a single box that will search, uh, you know, names of industries, client names, meaning the organizations that are spending the money to get uh, their policy preferences implemented, uh, the firms that they hire, the bill names, agencies, and so on. So uh, if, for example, we search for space, you'll see that the results you get can point you to the defense and aerospace industry, where, you, where you'll see uh, who is part of that industry and how they, um, you know, what lobbying activities they have undertaken. You can look at aerospace as an issue that they report lobbying on. Uh, you know, if you visit the <clears throat> this NASA page, you'll see who targeted NASA uh, in their lobbying and what kind of issues they worked on. And then we have a list, a long list of the organizations that actually spend the money to lobbying, which we call clients. Um, <clears throat> So you can uncheck or check these boxes to eliminate uh, whole categories, or you can further filter things by keyword. Uh, and we'll just try to find SpaceX here. So we'll look at everybody with an X in their name. And here we have SpaceX. So we'll show you the profile for a company. Um, And you'll see similar information. If you were to look at an industry uh, or a lobbying firm, you would see similar categories. I'm just gonna focus mainly on a uh, company here uh, to kind of go through things and show you the types of information that are found in these reports. So the hired, and you 
after looking at the summary page, which again shows a historical uh, trend of their spending, uh, in this case, it's pretty much just been growing since they started. But sometimes when you look at an industry or a company, you'll see a spike in a certain year. And that does usually correlate to some kind of regulatory proposal or something Congress is talking about that affects them very specifically. And you will see a spike in their lobbying spending and then maybe a return to a more normal <clears throat> rate. But to get more into the details, you, you'll want to click on these uh, options under the organization's name. Hired firms will show you the lobbying firms that they hired and how much they paid them. Uh, lobbyists is talking about individual lobbyists. And uh, of course, clicking on their the lobbyist name will take you to a page that profiles that individual person, shows you who they work for, all the clients they represented, um, contr contributions they made to politicians, and anyone with one of these little uh, arrow, circular arrow icons uh, is has been through the revolving door, which means they have uh, government employment as well. And clicking on this icon will take you to their uh, employment history that will show you all the various jobs they've had. So for instance, uh, if one of these people worked for NASA previously, you might be able to find that in their revolving door profile. Uh, we also have, they also report the agencies uh, that they targeted. Almost every single report that comes in says uh, U.S. Senate and U.S. House on it, which unfortunately is as specific as things get at the um, for the Congress. Uh, but if they're contacting executive branch agencies, they report that as well. So you can see who uh, they've contacted. We also have the legislation or bills that they worked on. And again, if you uh, click on the bill number, it would take you to a page that shows you everyone who's lobbying on that bill. And then the report images uh, tab just show, gives you a way to link back and look at the primary source, so the actual report that was filed, if you want to uh, read through that. Now, I skipped over issues, and I want to go into that a little deeper. Uh, these issues are uh, really general. It, they pick from a prescribed list of a little less than 100 issues, I think, uh, like taxes, Medicare, uh, as you can see here, telecommunications and defense. And then within each of those, they're supposed to describe in more detail what they've been working on. And you can see that by clicking on this number here, which is really just the number of reports for that year uh, that reported working on aerospace in this case. If you click on that, it will show you the actual text that they wrote. Uh, and that will include things like the bill numbers. Uh, this is where we determine what bills they worked on, uh, as well as just a more descriptive text of what they've been working on. Um, you can see how this might be pretty useful to give you an idea of what they're committed to pushing for. They might uh, use much more specific terms uh, that that you're familiar with, uh, as opposed to these broad uh, issue areas. But it is self-policed, really. So while these here are pretty good, uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see someone uh, writing something very general. Like, for instance, this one has filed one report that just said issues related to national security space, space launch. Well. Of course. Um, so there are varying levels of usefulness there. 
uh, but there's a lot of information to be had additionally. And this page makes it really easy uh, because you're looking at here something like half a dozen different filings and we've pulled it all together so you can look at each, uh, everything they described throughout all of their filings for that year. And then if you want to go back and look again at the primary source, that's what this read report link is. Uh, so this is really just a snapshot of uh, what we have on Open Secrets. We don't have time to walk through specifically all of it. Uh, but as we briefly covered what part of the government they contacted, who did the lobbying, even who those individuals uh, made campaign contributions to. Uh, so there really is a wealth of information there. And there are two additional pages I do want to highlight. This trends in spending page starts with a year to date total. So what we're looking at here is first quarter spending through the years. Uh, so you can compare what uh, this year's looks like compared to previous years. And when we get the next reports in at the end of July, uh, it will change to show spending through the first half of every year for comparison. But the really useful thing here is down further where you can pick any two quarters or full years and compare them. Uh, you can pick anything going back to 90 uh, to 2008, I believe. Um, and then you get some total spent summary stuff here. But the real interesting thing is uh, the industry information here. So you can pick two periods of time and compare uh, how much the health industry has spent in in those two periods, meaning uh, you can look at how their spending has changed over time uh, for for a specific uh, you know period of time that you select that may correspond to some kind of legislative event for that industry or uh, something in the real world where you can uh, look at how their spending has changed. The other one I want to show you is recent registrations, which shows is updated pretty much daily uh, and shows new contracts that are being uh, set up to lobby in the future. So for instance, Klein Johnson Group, which is a, a lobbying firm, was hired by Keller Postman recently uh, to work on law enforcement and VA issues and you see the individual individual lobbyists who will likely be working uh, on these issues for that client. And then this report link again goes to the primary source. So this just gives can give you a window to something more timely since we have quarterly reporting, uh, there's sometimes significant delays before you get new data like right now we don't know what was happening as far back as April. Um, so you can sometimes look here if you're looking for a company and see if they've hired a bunch of new lobbying firms, for instance, and that can be interesting. Um, so now uh, I'll hand it back to Pete to show you the tools we have to explore state level lobbying. Great, thanks, Dan. Um, so I talked a little bit about the variability of disclosure practices at the state level. I'm going to touch on that uh, in just a moment here a little bit more, and then we'll dive into how to uh, run research on state lobbying data. Uh, I will note that uh, later this year, we will be launching a page on the Open Secrets website that has integrated federal and state lobbying uh, as well. The, the state lobbying will be fed um, from the same data collection processes that we uh, currently exercise. So the parameters that I describe about uh, the disclosure and uh, what data we have and so forth uh, will all still be applicable. Uh, and we will be able to um, do the kinds of research uh, that we uh, are looking at today uh, as well. 
Um, before I get going, though, uh, I do want to clarify that if you have any questions, uh, there is a uh, Q and A uh, option. Uh, so there are uh, you may be used to chat options on Zoom uh, because of the number of attendees uh, and the way that the webinar uh, system is set up on Zoom. Uh, that chat option is not applicable for uh, regular attendees, but there is a Q and A option. And feel free to toss questions in there. Uh, we will have plenty of time at the end for Q and A, uh, and uh, Anna and Dylan will. Uh, field those to us uh, as we wrap up our presentation here. So on the uh, lobbying disclosure, uh, this is a publication we made available uh, on uh, opensecrets.org uh, last year. Uh, and uh, we'll drop a, a link to this in the chat as well. Uh, the, uh, it examines the disclosure practices at the federal level and at the state level. Uh, and uh, kudos to Dan and to our uh, senior data researcher, uh, Brendan Glavin, on putting this together. Uh, I'm going to skip through some of the introductory pieces and just mention the four aspects of disclosure that it measures and kind of how the states uh, stack up with a nice little map. Um, so this measures who is lobbying and who is paying for it, how well that is disclosed at the state level, uh, how much the lobbyists are getting paid or the firms. Uh, this is that compensation piece that I was referring to uh, earlier in the presentation. Uh, that is the key component of the actual data uh, in lobbying. Uh, again, 80 to 90% or more of the money uh, that is spent on lobbying is that compensation piece. And in fact, at the federal level, that is what is reported. Uh, at the state level, compensation uh, may or may not be reported. And if, um, depending on the state, uh, lobbying payments for things like lunches and so forth may or may not be reportable as well. Uh, how timely the disclosure is, uh, this is quite variable at the state level. Um, somewhat common disclosure uh, timeframes are monthly or quarterly. Uh, we've got one or two states that file uh, disclosure reports every two months. Um, sometimes there's uh, disclosure once a year. Uh, and so that is pretty problematic for understanding uh, efforts being made to uh, influence policy at the state capitol, uh, certainly during a legislative session. Uh, one of the uh, states with the once year reporting is my original home state of South Dakota, unfortunately. So a little bit of a, a knock on my home state there. Uh, and then how easily can the public access this disclosed information? Um, the last time we expanded the number of states in which we were able to collect uh, lobbying spending data uh, was a few years ago. And uh, we uh, will be doing that again, likely uh, in a couple of years. Um, but uh, an example of a difficult uh, accessibility for lobbying information uh, comes out of Pennsylvania. A few years ago, they do require uh, compensation to be reported, uh, so you do get that bulk of the spending. Uh, however, uh, until recently, they did not provide that online in any format, uh, and the way that you access that data was actually by going to Harrisburg. Uh, and getting it out of a file cabinet, making copies of it uh, in the office there. Uh, so that can be pretty challenging. Uh, we do get data in various other formats, though. Most of the data that we do collect is available online. Um, we also get data via CDs or sometimes um, if you have a CD drive, uh, so that, that can be uh, a piece of uh, technology that you need to keep around. Uh, or um, sometimes we uh, do special requests and get data emailed to us by a state agency if it isn't available in a bulk uh, format from the state website. This disclosure scorecard goes through various aspects of uh, each of these measurements of lobbying disclosure uh, and then measures the states uh, overall to sort of grade them. Uh, so these are, uh, this is a map of the state uh, disclosure quality. Uh, and the darker the state is, the higher the score it is receiving for uh, lobbying disclosure. And if you mouse over a state, uh, you will get uh, information about how it's scored in each of these categories out of a uh, top number of five. And then there is also a link to actually a table of uh, these disclosure measurements as well. But this is uh, basically meant to point out how variable um, those definitions, the disclosure practices, and the data actually are uh, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. If you'd like to see a map of the top scoring states specifically, uh, there they are. And I'll throw a special shout out to South Carolina for scoring well here. Uh, they have traditionally scored very poorly in our campaign finance disclosure practices uh, measurements, uh, but shining uh, a little brightly here in the lobbying disclosure. So I am going to move over to our followthemoney.org website. 
Uh, as Dan mentioned, uh, we are uh, at Open Secrets, the product of the merger of the Center for Responsive Politics and the National Institute on Money and Politics, uh, which operated the OpenSecrets.org and FollowTheMoney.org websites, respectively. Uh, I come from the Institute side, so the FollowTheMoney.org, uh, and uh, we are working on integrating those uh, lobbying data uh, at the state and federal levels, uh, as we've talked about here. Uh, but in the meantime, we will uh, tour the FollowTheMoney.org website to uh, query lobbying data. This website is very much designed uh, for queries. Uh, I will start by saying that uh, if you have a story that you are working on um, where you want to look at some lobbying data, reach out uh, to us and we can help you uh, build that query or send you a link to it um, so that you can get that data as needed. This website is not really prepackaging data. It is very much designed for people who want to query a specific data set uh, and pot potentially even download that data. I'm going to start up here in the uh, Ask Anything quarter. Um, there are a couple of ways to get into lobbying data here. This is my preferred approach. Uh, another option is coming down here below the map of the United States and coming down to the lobbying expenditures data. And here you can select a state and year combination and look at a state and year. Or you can click on this lobbying expenditures link and just look at all of our data at once. This Ask Anything tool allows you to run a specialized query. What I'm going to do is look at all of our lobbying data over the last several years. So I'm going to click on this Ask Anything tool. It says I'm currently looking at contributions data. I'm going to change that to lobbying expenditure data. And I usually keep my screen quite small, so I'll zoom in a bit there. So we get some options to look at spending by particular spenders. Uh, here we can look at a specific uh, organization uh, a specific uh, industry and so forth. Uh, recipients, so if we're interested in payments made to a specific firm, uh, we can find those uh, payments here or by state and year. And for this demonstration, I'm going to focus on the state year aspect of it, uh, but know that those uh, other options are available. Here, I'm going to look at our spending across all the states in which we collect the data uh, in the last several years. So I'm going to click on specific year and just check these years down. As you can see, we have data going back to 2002. I'm going to go back to 2015 here. Um, we actually began collecting this lobbying spending data in or about 2012. Uh, and then we're able to backfill prior years in selected states uh, that made uh, bulk data sets available for older years. Uh, and 2002 uh, is as far back as we were able to get uh, at that point, which is a credit to the agencies that had digital data in 2002 when, when many filings were still on paper. By looking at lobbying spending in 2015 through 2023, you will now see that this sentence says, show me lobbying spending in selected years. And I'm just going to click go. So this query now is pulling up uh, the, um, the same sentence that I uh, ran before, show me lobbying spending in selected years, and then the number of expenditures that we've cataloged and the total dollar amount of spending. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we do get this data in specific states. Uh, you can get a list of that by clicking on this jurisdiction box. Uh, and what this will do then is total those dollar amounts uh, by the jurisdiction. Uh, the functionality of these checkboxes is, is essentially a Excel pivot table. Uh, so once you've got your data set there, uh, you can use these checkboxes to create pivot tables with the data set. Uh, so this is a list of the states uh, in which we have data from 2015 through 2022 uh, and the amount of money that we've cataloged in each state during that full time period, again, from our query here. And if I click on this filing jurisdiction, I can sort that alphabetically uh, so you can get a list of those states in alphabetical order. Uh, some states are missing. As I mentioned, about half of the states do not require compensation to be reported. Uh, in those states where compensation is not reported, we do not collect the data. Um, because again, it is often 90% or more of the money uh, in lobbying. Uh, we focus our efforts in more productive activities uh, than collecting data uh, in those states. However, we do have lobbying registrations available in each state. I won't be focusing on those today, um, but if you are interested in lobbying efforts, uh, measurements in a specific state or set of states where spending data is not reportable, um, please reach out and we can give you uh, sort of um, an analog, uh, at least, of measuring the number of lobbyists that a company or an organization is hiring 
uh, to represent it within each state and whether or not that's been going up and down and so forth or an industry and that sort of thing. We can also uh, get a breakdown of how much has been happening in each state and year. Uh, again, this query is across states. So this is going to show us all of the states and years in our data from uh, these selected year parameters that I have here, 2015 to 2023. Uh, the tables always sort down by dollar amount, um, but then you can sort again by state and get a breakdown of how much is being spent in each year in each state. Um, I'm going to dive into uh, the California 2022 data as the last full year available in California. Uh, we will be updating the California 2023 data, in fact, tomorrow. Uh, so that will be up to date through the uh, latest reports there. Uh, what I've done is clicked on the magnifying lens here. So anytime you see something of interest uh, in a table that you generate uh, through this pivot table uh, sort of activity, uh, you can use that magnifying lens on the far left to dive into the specific records and dollars that you are uh, looking at and get into more detail there. So within this California 2022 data, uh, I can take a look at things like uh, who are the uh, biggest spenders? I'm going to click on this spender checkbox. And again, this is working essentially as a pivot table. So now if I'm looking in California, who are the biggest spenders on lobbying, specifically in California, uh, this is our list. Uh, Western States Petroleum Association is typically one of the top three in a given year in California. Um, we're seeing uh, other uh, organizations that are often uh, highly rated um, or highly spending organizations uh, in various states or in California specifically. The California Teachers Association was actually a little bit lower in 2022 than it typically is. It is also usually a top five uh, spending organization, which is a little bit unusual at the state level and that a union would get that high, uh, but this one certainly frequently does uh, have another union up here. Uh, and then energy companies uh, are also um, pretty big spenders in California. Uh, they don't quite dominate the list in the same way they do in Texas, but uh, they do tend to uh, be populated throughout the top spenders. We can also add the business classification here. So now we're looking at the classification that we have assigned here at Open Secrets to each one of these spenders. Uh, we have, for those of, those of you uh, who are on this call may be familiar with the classification systems that we have, but it is a three-tier classification system essentially. So uh, we have a very broad classification such as uh, ideology, for example, and then uh, a mid-tier classification within that, that might be pro-environmental policy, uh, and then a specific uh, in, uh, classification that we'll get into uh, subclassifications within that mid-tier. So um, those are all available here. Uh, and in fact, you can even group up by things like <clears throat> just that uh, classification here. So I'm grouping up by the mid-tier classification and having a look at that spending in California. Uh, this website will show you the dollars that we have not categorized uh, and uh, does tend to be because it's an aggregation of things that would split among uh, categorizations if we were to categorize it does tend to be uh, the largest or second largest typically uh, on the list um, the number of records tends to also be higher uh, the average dollar amount per record tends to be significantly lower uh, than those that we've categorized because we do prioritize those bigger organizations that are uh, making stronger efforts to influence uh, governmental policy uh, and coding, uh, categorizing these organizations is just a never ending project. Um, but uh, ha if we were to code that, they would sprinkle among all these other categorizations. So you can get a sense here of which uh, industries are really uh, influencing California's state government the most. Everything that I'm doing, by the way, on this interface uh, is reflecting in the URL. Uh, so for example, uh, as I ran this query for lobbying data, in a specific set of years, uh, that is reflected in this URL here. And then when I grouped by state and by year, uh, that uh, grouping shows up here as well. What this means is that these links are live links. So you can embed them in stories that you're writing if you'd like, um, or uh, save them uh, and come back to this table. Uh, tables will update as we continue to upload data as well. Uh, you can also download these tables uh, using a, uh, an account, which you can register for an account or log into your account in the far upper right corner of this website on any page. Um, it is free. Um, we ask for your email address and then send you a link to make sure that you're an actual human being. I think everybody on this call is a human being. Uh, and so you can then uh, just click on that link, verify that you are human uh, and start downloading data as well. And you can download the tables that you're generating uh, from these queries. Uh, 
Um, I've been focusing primarily on the spenders and the spender industry. Uh, we do also have information about the recipient of the lobbying spending. Uh, so if I were, for example, to click on just the recipient box, uh, this does take about 10 seconds to load. So I've preloaded that here. Uh, this is the list of uh, recipients of California 2022 lobbying expenditures. Uh, you will see the number one recipient in California is other payments, uh, which is kind of an unfortunate potpourri of, of spending. Uh, other payments in California uh, refer to um, sort of miscellaneous lobbying expenditures. Uh, unfortunately, they do account for uh, about 20% or so of the money that we see uh, in California. Uh, and for folks who might be reporting in California, I'm happy to send you a, a fact sheet from uh, the state lobbying agency there uh, with more information about what those other payments uh, are. Uh, In-house uh, employee lobbyists, um, this is something that is pretty common where big organizations that are lobbying a lot will actually have built-in lobbying uh, positions in their organization. In California, if that is the case, then you do not have to report the names of those uh, lobbying on your behalf if they're actually employees of your company uh, in certain circumstances. Uh, and so that is uh, why we see that coming in. And then you see the big actual firms that are focused on lobbying in California. What we've often found uh, in looking at state level lobbying uh, is that firms, uh, even um, when lobbying is being done by big national groups, uh, the firms that are lobbying at the state level will be uh, firms that are really specialized in lobbying in that state or in a few states in the region. Um, firms tend to be hired not because of a specific policy um, expertise, but because of their relationships with elected officials uh, and their ability to um, get access uh, to elected officials and other public officials uh, for that policy um, influence. So each uh, state will have kind of a different list then of those uh, top uh, firms. We can also tie the uh, payments and the spenders. Uh, so here we're looking at uh, how much uh, each uh, client basically paid uh, each firm. And I can come down again, the other payments in-house lobbyists start to sort of dominate this list, uh, but then you can start getting into some of these big uh, relationships here uh, between specific uh, companies uh, and their, uh, their firms. If you'd like to start seeing those relationships, if we're working on uh, reporting about uh, which firms are working for which clients and how much they're getting paid to influence uh, energy policy or something like that, and we'll get into more of the policy specific discussions with our subsequent, uh, subsequent presentations. Um, but this is how you would do that. And then you could download this table and, and work with it in say Excel or something too. So that's a very quick rundown of the state piece. Uh, I will note that noticeably absent here is any information about the bills uh, being lobbied on or the issues being lobbied on. Um, that information is reported in some states. Uh, it is oftentimes difficult to collect uh, it oftentimes is not reported at the state level as it is at the federal level. Um, that um, bill or uh, issue information um, is available in certain states within our data set, and we can uh, work with, uh, with you if you're working on specific stories in a given state and let you know if we have that information. It is typically not very usable. Uh, California happens actually to be one of the states where we do have information about the legislation uh, that is being worked on through these lobbying expenditure reports. Um, but they are just giant memo fields uh, that don't have very clear or at all any regulated formatting. Uh, so it becomes something that's difficult to, to provide in mass and would display very oddly. Um, there aren't um, uh, clean uh, data really available for that, uh, which is why it isn't presented on, on this view. Uh, but we do have it in a few states. Um, uh, and as I mentioned, we do have the lobbying uh, registrations. So who is working for whom uh, in uh, almost every state, we do get those registrations in every state, not every state ties the lobbyists and the clients together, uh, but most do, I think 48 currently are doing that. Uh, so we can usually offer uh, that information as a proxy measurement of the uh, efforts that an organization is making to influence policy as well. So with that, I will kick it back over to Dan to close us up and open up the Q&A. And just as a reminder, uh, if you have questions, do drop them into the Q&A uh, option on your Zoom uh, should be down next to um, the other uh, features on your Zoom window. Great. Uh, so I'll move into the Q&A here in a second, but I do just want to 
say that you should feel free to get in touch with us if you ever have any questions about the website or things that you see there. If you don't see something that you hoped to get, uh, or if you need to slice the data a different way, we are uh, happy to do custom data polls. And as Pete just demonstrated, the follow the money website is very good at letting you uh, look at whatever custom uh, set of criteria you want, but the federal is sometimes a little more difficult to do that. So uh, feel free to get in touch with us. And with that, I see we have a couple questions. I think Anna was going to manage that. So uh, starting up on the questions, um, one of our questions is about uh, what the time period of was for the study. Um, so looking back on the report that you showed. Right, so I think this is referring to the uh, disclosure report there. Uh, that was as of the disclosure practices last year. Uh, so for 2022, uh, typically that includes 2021 as well. Uh, those uh, regulations tend to be applied at least uh, during this changeover of legislative sessions, although not always. Uh, so 2022 is the time period of that uh, study. But we hope to do future studies as well and sort of measure the progress of disclosure, hopefully progress of disclosure. Uh, we have seen some uh, instances of states trying to uh, get better at the reporting and lobbying um, uh, efforts uh, and even campaign finance efforts too, and then take steps backward, unfortunately. Um, uh, regulations sometimes don't come with budgets, uh, and so agencies will do what they can, and things sometimes don't work out, and things like paper filing sometimes come back after an electronic system has been um, sort of launched and fizzled. Uh, but hopefully, uh, generally, we do see progress as time goes on. Technology does become increasingly accessible, uh, and regulations uh, at the moment seem to be trending uh, in a more transparent way, uh, at least in campaign finance. Um, the lobbying movement is a little bit slower. Uh, so we haven't seen as much improvement in what specifically is uh, meant to be reported in lobbying, uh, but still moving kind of in the right direction. Great, we've got one more follow-up to that as well. Uh, so have you done a specific kind of scorecard for 2020 or before as well? We haven't done a scorecard prior to this. Uh, the Sunlight Foundation, um, which existed until I think the late 20 teens, um, did a scorecard uh, in 2015, uh, looking at the lobbying disclosure practices across the states uh, at that time. Um, you can find, I don't have the link to that handy, but typically you can find that just by Googling uh, how transparent is your state lobbying 2015, and it should be one of the top results there. I recommend checking that out. Um, they uh, had a kind of a spreadsheet uh, table of uh, three or four maybe five different aspects of lobbying disclosure that they measured. Uh, one of them was that compensation piece. Uh, it, it wasn't weighted. Uh, all, all of the aspects were weighted the same. Uh, really, uh, the compensation and the online availability, uh, which we should be expecting at this point in 2023, um, uh, should be weighted pretty heavily, I think, uh, and especially that compensation piece, because if you aren't reporting it at all, the format doesn't matter really as much. Um, uh, but but it is a great measurement of where states were at uh, about eight years ago at this point now. Great, thank you. Um, one more question. Um, is there a way to identify or collect data on specific politicians who are sp especially susceptible to lobbying and the extent to which they cave to lobbyists? So we have done some internal um, measuring about how, where, so um, there used to be a, a great organization called Digital Democracy uh, that was based out of um, the University of California system. Uh, uh, I forget exactly which uh, campus um, that cataloged uh, at the state level in a few different states, uh, which organizations uh, sent lobbyists to testify on which bills uh, and uh, put that into a, a digital format that we were able to uh, incorporate temporarily a few years ago. Uh, they, they have since closed, unfortunately, um, and take some measurements about which organizations were kind of getting the right outcome of the bill, whether the bill passed or failed, and whether the organization was supporting or opposing the bill. Um, we haven't been able to tie that to specific uh, legislators. Um, that's a really difficult question. Um, 
the um, knowing how a legislator was going to vote in advance uh, is challenging uh, in comparison to how they might have voted after being lobbied. Uh, and oftentimes the information about who specifically is being spoken to by a lobbyist on behalf of which organization uh, or organizations plural um, is pretty hard to come by uh, other than through uh, committee testimony uh, most of the time. Uh, and that committee testimony typically doesn't live, excuse me, in the same place as uh, lobbying disclosures. It will be through uh, rather than through a lobbying disclosure or ethics agency that uh, would be available where uh, states do provide that through um, legislative committee web pages and that kind of thing, typically. Dan, I don't know if there's a better answer at the federal level. Uh, well, the answer is very similar to that. Uh, I'll also say that one of the problems with looking at votes is that uh, a lot of the big lobbying wins happen uh, as the legislation is crafted and not necessarily um, fighting over the vote at the end, which is often um, a known quantity. The other thing I'll say is that, uh, you know, tying together all of the various tools that we provide is one way to kind of try and get at this. So we know when an individual lobbyist gives money to a politician who they may have previously worked for or someone else at their firm worked for them. Uh, if you look at our member pages, you can <clears throat> uh, look at the organizations and their employees that are contributing to their campaigns. And we often have a handy little check mark whether uh, they received money from lobbyists working for that organization, for instance. So in addition to some of the legwork type things that Pete mentioned, like looking at who's testifying uh, and that kind of thing, there are some dots you can connect uh, by looking at, at the various uh, types of influence data we have on open secrets. I will add one more uh, key uh, point here uh, in understanding how effective that lobbying really is. Um, the clients themselves are sort of telling us uh, how effective they think the lobbying is by how much they're paying um, to, to be represented. Uh, and in particular, how much they're paying a specific firm or a specific client, uh, I'm sorry, a specific firm or a specific lobbyist to represent them. Uh, not everybody gets paid the same uh, as a lobbyist or a lobbying firm. Uh, and those that tend to be more effective uh, tend to get paid more. And so you can uh, get a sense of how really robust uh, a uh, lobbying effort is by which firms are being hired. And if those firms tend to be getting paid a lot uh, by that client or by other clients, um, and uh, those firms then are going to be the uh, kind of the kingpins of, of the lobbying efforts. Uh, and that is, uh, again, those firms get paid because they're really good at making connections. Uh, a lot of them are former legislators or congresspersons or key staff uh, from congressional or legislative offices, uh, building those connections on the, the in the Capitol. Uh, and that, that dollar amount really is the key measurement of how effective at least the clients think that those, um, those efforts are gonna be. And I think we have time for a couple more quick questions. That's actually a great segue into one of them. So could um, either or both of you comment on the impact of contributions from individual lobbyists and what that has on the effectiveness of lobbying influence? Uh, the question, the person question, asking this question know, mentions that they know that bundlers of, and donors are often a key factor. Yes, uh, I mean, bundling <clears throat> is huge because Members of Congress spend a, an inordinate amount of time on fundraising, like hours and hours a day. So anyone who can help lighten that load, uh, I'm sure gets a friendly reception. Uh, and there is also not, well, it's not, uh, you know, a straight quid pro quo you give to my campaign or else. Uh, we do hear stories of people, uh, you know, and a lobbyist who already has a meeting with the congressional office, but if their firm's PAC has not contributed yet, that will be mentioned. 
which again is not like you do this and I'll do this uh, quid pro quo thing, but uh, fundraising is very important uh, to politicians, obviously, and um, being in an office as good graces is very important to lobbyists and uh, effectively doing their job. Uh, one thing I'll add too is that we find that incumbents will raise significantly more money and uh, significantly earlier uh, from political action committees or in the states where corporations or unions are permitted to make contributions directly from the treasuries. Uh, those contributions, uh, the, the organizational contributions uh, tend to come to incumbents. Uh, it is very unlikely that you will see many uh, contributions from companies or other uh, established organizations to a challenger, uh, somebody who's challenging an incumbent, uh, and even candidates running for open seats tend not to get as many of those uh, as incumbents do. Uh, for example, uh, at and is among the largest contributors to state candidates, uh, and they give 95% of their money to incumbents, and then uh, like 4.7%, I think, to, to candidates running in open seats, and then you know, just a few bucks maybe to a challenger who's maybe a shoe in uh, to win. Uh, and that really is because they don't care these, these organizations usually, um, with some exceptions, don't care about partisan affiliation either. What they want to do is contribute to people who are going to be making decisions. And in fact, uh, those incumbents are already in office making decisions too. Uh, so those contributions really are meant to, to open those doors. They're not and, typically ideological, ideological. And that, that same dynamic exists at the federal level too, to yeah. be clear. Um, and I think we're coming up on the 2 p.m. mark at this point. Um, if we want to just one more quick question, is there a way to get sure. state logging data across multiple states looking at specific sectors or ideological issues? Absolutely. So the, um, the tour that I gave here uh, in the interest of uh, keeping it short uh, was looking at uh, just all of our uh, lobbying data at the state level uh, across those states where we were able to get the spending uh, and in selected years. Um, that was something where then I uh, showed the amount per state and year. Uh, you can certainly get into more detail uh, with who uh, was spending in each state and year, uh, and even adding that recipient information. It's just a matter of clicking the corresponding checkboxes to make that pivot table essentially. So checking the jurisdiction, the year, the spender, and the recipient, uh, and uh, even that economic interest uh, box for business or industry, uh, whichever level you'd like, uh, will create that table. Uh, which then is an embeddable link or something that you can download as well. Um, or you can reach out to us and we can help you put that together. So. Uh, I, I will note that the federal level, uh, we, we can also provide that. So um, certainly if you're looking at a, an industry over time at the federal level, um, and our industry classifications are the same at both, so we can provide industry breakdowns at the federal and state level uh, combined as well. So. Okay, I think we're coming up on two o'clock here. So I want to, uh, I know we didn't get to quite all the questions, but uh, we will be doing more of these webinars, uh, specific issue-based uh, primarily coming up. Uh, so uh, we did drop a link in the chat to those. So please uh, register for those. And we'll be doing some more uh, conversations about getting into specific issues uh, as you're reporting on uh, different policies and objectives. Uh, and uh, we'll be able to answer more questions then. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Take care, everyone.